Now, I've heard of magic that can make your skin crawl, but this is ridiculous. Welcome to Monster of the Week, I am Josiah, your host, otherwise known as Dungeon Dad, and today we're talking about a monster that literally made me stop turning pages through the book when I saw the artwork. Over on Patreon, I did a poll asking patrons what kind of monsters they'd like to see in upcoming videos. People voted most on Creepy, and second most on Undead. So today we're doing best of both worlds, and I'm gonna bring you something that is both creepy and undead, because those things usually go hand in disembodied hand. The monster we're talking about today can be found in both 3.5 and 4th edition. Despite the fact that this creature is in two separate editions of the game, I haven't really heard it mentioned or brought up anywhere, and it's a pretty cool monster. Like I said though, it is fairly obscure, and that's because it's only in 3.5 in the Libris Mortis, the Book of the Dead. And in 4th edition, if you want to find this monster, you're looking at a supplement called Open Grave, Secrets of the Dead. Obscure heritage aside though, let's get under the skin of this monster and talk about the Forsaken Shell. This creature is essentially the skin of a previously living creature made sentient by horrid necrotic magic. These guys are undead, but don't follow the same traits that you see in a lot of zombies. They're much more intelligent than your average zombie, and they can be quite malevolent and vengeful in some cases. Being undead, horrifying, malevolent, and vengeful is just a recipe for disaster when your players are involved. The Forsaken Shell, however, is not a brute force combatant. They rely heavily on stealth and tactics, which goes very well with their intelligent nature. So today, we're going to talk about just exactly what the Forsaken Shell can do in battle, some ways that we might change them up a little bit to suit our needs, and of course, how you can use this creature in your 5th edition game. Most importantly though, above those practical things, we're going to try to sneak in as many skin-based puns as we can. Let's go. Now to get started with these skinny creatures, they can move 30 feet, which is pretty standard for most medium-sized humanoids. However, what is not standard is yes, they can walk like a human, which would be disgusting to see, but they can also slither along the ground kind of like a giant gross snake. This gives them a lot of options for movement as far as stealth is concerned. If there are big enough cracks and crevices in the dungeon, maybe they can sneak through those areas into other rooms. Plus, being able to sneak along the walls or ceiling, if there's room for them to do so, can be an awesome tactic for ambushing a party by dropping on top of them. The real value here though is that it's just pretty gross. Whether they are walking or slithering along the ground, when the party first sees these things, they are going to be horrified by the fact that a creature's skin seems to be moving about on its own. However, that is not the most horrifying thing about this creature. Now, when the Forsaken Shell actually engages in combat, however, it basically has a slam attack or a slap attack as it's referred to in the book. The skin slap is your pretty average melee attack. It does an okay amount of damage, but what makes it unique is that if a creature is hit by this attack, they actually lose one of their hit die. This isn't going to be super detrimental to the players, but it instills that idea that these creatures are more than just walking bags of flesh. Their touch deals necrotic damage and is actually stealing the life essence from the creatures that they are in combat with. So while losing a hit die may not be a huge deal, although in some cases it could be a pretty big deal. The other side of this is that the Forsaken Shell actually heals back 1d10 hit points when it makes this attack. So it's stealing that hit die from the players and then essentially using it to reinvigorate itself. Now that can be pretty terrifying in some circumstances and I think does a good job of building up what this creature is. However, we haven't talked about the third part of this attack. The third and definitely the worst part of the skin slap attack is the fact that it initiates a grapple. So it's going to roll its grapple check upon which it has a pretty good bonus and if the target doesn't roll better, it is now grappled by the Forsaken Shell. Having the undead sentient skin of a previously living creature grabbing you is just a bad scene. However, what happens on its next turn is even worse if you can't escape. At the beginning of the Forsaken Shell's turn, if it is currently grabbing an opponent, it can use its next ability, which is called Envelop. When the Forsaken Shell does this, it essentially wraps itself like a second skin over the creature that it's grappling. Visually, this is just disgusting, and also knowing what we know about the necrotic damage already, you can probably see where this is going. As soon as it does this, it has the opportunity to move up to 15 feet, so half its move speed, and drag the creature it's enveloping with it. The enveloped creature now takes a devastating amount of necrotic damage. On top of that, the Forsaken Shell is also healing as it drains the very life force out of its victim. And as for the victim, on their turn, they are now encased by the Forsaken Shell. They can still move around, but they can only move half their move speed. In addition, it's going to consume their action to try to become unenveloped. And if they don't try to escape and they make an attack roll or do something else, they're obviously going to do so with disadvantage because they now have another sentient creature literally trying to smother them from the outside on all parts of their body. So this all sounds 
absolutely terrible, and it is, but trust me, it gets much worse. One thing that we don't want to overlook here is that the Forsaken Shell is now physically wrapped around this creature that it has enveloped. So as such, any creature that attacks it with a melee weapon, such as stabbing it with a sword or striking it with a hammer, is also going to deal half that amount of damage to the creature who is being enveloped. So the party might freak out a little bit when their paladin tries to stab through the Forsaken Shell, and yes, it does damage, but you're also stabbing your friend. Although in a lot of cases, that's going to be worth it. Especially if the paladin and the rogue don't really get along. I mean, hey, smite two evildoers with one sword, am I right? Inter-party conflict aside though, when the skin actually manages to kill a creature, it's no joke. Similarly to the white, when a creature is killed by a Forsaken Shell, at the start of the Forsaken Shell's next turn, that creature's skin peels off its body and rises up as another Forsaken Shell. That is terrible for the party if this happens. As I mentioned in the Yellow Musk Creeper video, any creature that takes away from the party and also builds up their own force is just a bad time. And this is possibly the worst example of that that I've found yet. Not to mention, if the party actually does succeed and they lose a member to a Forsaken Shell, it's going to be disgusting resurrecting that person back to life. That said though, for a horror campaign, these guys are ideal. When I read this ability and kind of visualized this happening to an adventuring party, I actually said out loud, this is disgusting <laughs> and that might be exactly what you want if you're running a horror based campaign or even just a regular campaign with a horrific dungeon no matter what the situation however it's guaranteed to be scintillating so this version of the monster is kind of a combination of the two that we find in the respective books and honestly i think it's pretty much great on its own however when it comes to modifying this creature i can't help but imagine what it would look like if this same magic was used on a creature like a giant the forsaken shell is pretty terrifying in its own right but a forsaken shell that stands 10 feet taller than you, that's just terrifying. And why stop there? You could even do this with a dragon. Maybe a powerful Draco Lich decided, hey, I don't need my old skin anymore. Let's make it sentient and use it as a guardian for my treasure hoard. That sounds like a great idea. The fourth edition creature actually does have some base stats for a dragon shell and what they call a titan shell, which is basically just a large creature. However, aside from the dragon having a breath weapon and the titan doing more damage, they're not super differentiated. To something like a dragon that has all these extra limbs, I would consider giving it the ability to maybe envelop multiple creatures at the same time. Or perhaps it still has some innate magic in it that allows it to temporarily take control of the skin of other creatures and force them to use their action to maybe attack an ally. Just something like that to make it more unique. Following the same train of thought, what would happen if this magic was used on a creature like a Beholder? A sack of skin that can now float off the ground and cast eye rays out of its now gaping holes where its eyes once were could be pretty terrifying. As the old saying goes, there's more than one way to skin a D&D monster, so I encourage you to just flip through the whole monster manual and imagine what any of those creatures would be like if they were just skin. I mean, maybe don't do that, but just keep it in mind if you're ever looking for a horror-themed version of a certain creature. Just skin them, make it sentient, and away you go. So as for actually using this creature in your game, there's a couple things we want to cover here, but first and foremost, the most important part of this creature, in my opinion, is the discovery of the remains from which it spawned. Honestly, I think that this is probably the most impactful part of this creature, and it really builds up tension leading into the encounter. It's one thing for your players to find dismembered and mangled corpses of past adventurers that went into the very same dungeon they are currently delving into. However, when they find those bodies completely intact but stripped of skin, that's kind of terrifying. The one thing the book actually mentions here that I think can be pretty useful is that these creatures, as intelligent, seek to hide the remains of their kills. When they kill something, the skin peels off of it and it becomes another forsaken shell. However, there's basically just this bloody mess left behind. As to not alert new prey coming into the dungeon of their presence, they take this and then they just stow it away somewhere. So maybe what tips off the players is there's a blood trail leading into a room that's just full of skinless bodies. Or maybe there's a closet with a toe just poking out through the crack in the door. Whatever way you choose to have your players discover the skinless remains of past adventurers, I guarantee you that they will be revolted and it will have an impact. A very lasting, scarring impact. If you really want to get under their skin, make part of this quest the meeting of an NPC and maybe they find that NPC's remains. That can be a good story element in its own right, but then when they actually have to fight the skin of the NPC they were supposed to meet, this is evil DMing at its finest. Now the most obvious use of this creature is of course 
as a typical dungeon denizen, especially in a dungeon where there's a lot of undead. If you've got the classic necromancer or some other kind of evil magic user, these could very well be minions that are serving that creature. However, one way that I thought would be a really interesting use of this creature would be to pair it with a lich. Now, I know what you're thinking. Pairing a lich with undead seems mind-blowing, right? But honestly, imagine a lich who is hundreds or thousands of years old even. His physical body has decayed to the point where he is little more than a skeleton. To actually get around through town or to navigate in the day without people taking second looks at him, maybe he has a forsaken shell that he has glamoured to not look so bloody, and he basically wears it like a suit. He just walks out of his lichly lair, ascends his arm, and the Forsaken Shell just envelops around his body. Much like Iron Man's suit from the popular Marvel movies. Except way, way grosser. Like a terrible version of Iron Man who's a necromancer and kills people. This isn't so much a story hook in its own right, but could be an interesting plot device and would really just add something memorable to an encounter with a necromancer or lich. Imagine the party's surprise when it comes time to fight and the necromancer skin and just peels off of his body, revealing his true form, and then that skin also joins in the brawl. I mean, who knows, maybe this guy actually has a collection of skins that he's been gathering throughout the years that all act as patrols in his lair, and also act as aliases when he wants to just suit up and head into a town. It's kind of like the doppelganger archetype who is actually playing as several different NPCs, although the players don't know it, except way worse because he's not actually shifting into that, he's wearing the skin of those NPCs. Speaking of skinny NPCs though, maybe the players come across an entire town that has been afflicted by this magic. I mean, it's one thing to find a town that has been destroyed and turned into zombies, but it's another thing to find a town that has been destroyed, all the remains left skinless, and those skins now walking around roaming the night. The fact that these things are intelligent too means that if a band of travelers comes through the town, they're not going to just wander out like a normal zombie and attack them. Maybe the party's seeking refuge because they've had a hard long journey down the mountain or wherever they're coming from, and they stumble upon this tiny village which is completely empty. As they do some researching, maybe in say the bottom of the well or some other hidden but not too hidden area, they find a bunch of skinless corpses of long dead creatures. Humanoid creatures even. That's pretty gross, but chalk it up to brutal barbarians raiding the village. They can still stay here for the night, right? Should be fine. And of course, when they lay down to rest, the ranger who's up on watch spots something out of the corner of their eye, something slithering beneath the floorboards. I think you can kind of paint the rest of this picture for yourself from here on, but that could be a really memorable encounter for a party that just wanted a good night's rest. And maybe they'll actually discover the creatures before resting for the night or just choose to move on. Either way, if they don't engage with those creatures, they'll be left wondering what that was all about. And if they do engage with those creatures before resting, they'll feel like they've accomplished something, got a one up in their situation and be rewarded with a safe rest for the night. Anyways, that's all I've got this week for the murderous epidermis. But if you enjoyed listening to me talk about this creature and you wanna listen to me talk about other creatures, please subscribe to the channel. I have at least one new video every week. And if you're a new member of our community or you've already been a member of the community, but you haven't checked out our Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, Patreon, Discord accounts. You can find links to all that stuff in the description below. I do just also want to take a second to apologize for the lack of consistency the past couple weeks just with videos coming out. Life and work and all that other stuff has just gotten in the way. It's been pretty crazy busy, but I'm hoping that we're back on track now. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it, and I will see you next week.